Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to the Neuroethics Seminar Series. I am Bas Cochran, uh, Director of Neuroethics at the Center for Bioethics. As always, I want to thank uh, the Center for Bioethics, uh, the Mind Brain Behavior uh, Initiative at Harvard, and the Harvard Brain Initiative for their support of this seminar. Uh, once again, we've got a great uh, seminar, and their funding allows us to bring folks in from uh, out of town and around the world, uh, and we've done it yet again to uh, bring you a uh, great topic today. We're going to be talking about the therapeutic misconception in trials of ALS, or amyotrophic lateral sclerosis. And I'll introduce our uh, three speakers, and uh, they will take it away as usual. Uh, as usual, if you're watching via the WebEx, uh, you can tweet questions to us at, at HMS Bioethics, and we do monitor the uh, feed, and we have been occasionally been able to include questions from Twitter, so please feel free to uh, chime in electronically. Um, and as always, we will have dinner afterwards uh, upstairs, and everyone who is here is welcome to join us for that. This will go until 6 o'clock, uh, and the dinner will run until 7 or a little bit, a little bit thereafter. So our uh, three speakers today, uh, the first is uh, James Berry, who is the chief of the, uh, the unit chief of the MGH ALS Multidisciplinary Clinic, and a former fellow uh, with me at uh, Brigham and Women's in the Neuromuscular Division. Uh, and he's got the personal and professional experience with ALS uh, that we will build on tonight. Uh, Spencer Hay is a faculty member with me at the Center for Bioethics. Uh, he's a research fellow in the Department of Medicine at Brigham and Women's. And his PhD is in philosophy, and a major focus of his work has been about the ethics of trial design and trial conduct. And then finally, uh, Scott Kim is our guest from the NIH. He's a HMS grad, so welcome back once again, uh, and a PhD philosopher. He's now a senior investigator at, in the Department of Bioethics at NIH, and his recent work has centered on assessment of decision-making capacity for persons with neuropsychiatric disorders, uh, as well as research and informed consent. And this uh, topic tonight is a particular, is, is work that he has done here, so he's going to be sharing with us uh, some of his work. And I'm sure we're going to have you back as uh, I've been foreshadowing to you. Uh, so, welcome everybody, and uh, first up we'll have uh, James. Thanks. Thanks. Thanks for having me. This is, um, I think this is, so So I spend a lot of time seeing uh, people with ALS in clinic uh, and caring for them, and then uh, and then also doing clinical research and clinical trials, and so this is a, a topic that is uh, really near and dear to my heart, not only conceptually, but actually on a day-to-day -day basis. It's something that we, that we sort of think about and talk about. So it's good to have some time to actually sit down and, and sort of digest what, what I see day-to-day. -day. Just, just for everybody to, to kind of review, so ALS is, or amyotrophic lateral sclerosis, is a motor neuron disease. It's a neurodegenerative motor neuron disease. So the onset is on average 55 years old, but I've seen patients from 19 years old to 91 years old, and, and there are even some some reports of childhood onset of disease. So it's, you know, it's a, it's a wide spectrum of ages. Um, it is, it, it occurs in sort of two forms. One is familial, that is uh, inherited uh, in Mendelian genetics way in families. And we're learning more and more about that. That accounts for about 10 to 15%, even maybe 20% of ALS at this point. But that number has increased as we learn more about the genetics of ALS. We used to say five to 10%. Uh, the other 80 to 85% is sporadically occurring, and we don't really understand all of the triggers for it. Um, we know a lot about the, the cascades of pathology that, that go wrong in the motor neurons and in surrounding cells, uh, but we don't know exactly why it occurs, so that's an active area of research. Um, we, the, the disease has a, an average survival of three to five years after some onset. So once people first notice weakness, Average survival is three to five years. In the most aggressive cases, people succumb to the disease in under a year. And uh, there are some sort of long survivors who we might follow for a decade or more, but they are very uncommon. So it's an aggressive disease. Um, and we have one FDA approved medication. Uh, in clinical trials in the early 90s, it was shown to extend survival by three months. Uh, it was not shown, not demonstrated in those trials to have any effect on. Um, 
And you know, there have been subsequent observational studies that maybe show more of a benefit. One might summarize the data in a simple way by saying perhaps it extends, uh, it slows the course of the disease by, by 10%. That's a, that's a very broad summary, and it's, you know, there's a lot of discussion about that, but it's a, it's a modest effect. We have many symptomatic therapies, but that's our one disease-modifying therapy. So there's an urgent need for, for drug development in animals. And in fact, we spend a lot of time, we see people in clinic about every three months, um, and every three months we have most people fairly dramatic clinical changes, and we're, we're often you know, attending to those. But many, many patients ask about research, <clears throat> becoming involved in research. I sort of divide my activities in research into sort of two categories, clinical research and clinical trials. That's the way I conceptualize it, with research being things to understand the disease, imaging, and, and biofluid biomarkers, and, and, and so on. Um, clinical trials are, you know, testing an, an intervention to see if it's a potential therapy. And many patients come to us, because we're an active research center, seeking out clinical trials, and which is, you know, which is just good. It's good for recruitment, and, and it's good to have a motivated patient population. Many people are very involved in, in uh, helping think about you know, what, what we should do to bring trials faster to patients. But there are a few phenomena <coughs> that, that bring up this question of, of therapeutic misconception in, in ALS. One is, one is this, um, and this was a, actually a conversation that, with, that, that Klaus and I had that kind of led to maybe thinking about having this as a topic. We see patients who enter a trial, randomized clinical trial, and after some time um, feel that they're not having a benefit. Their assessment of their situation is that they don't see benefit. They then initiate a conversation about leaving the trial and potentially entering a different trial. If we have, if we're lucky enough to have you know, two trials, two or more trials going on at the same time, a very, very understandable conversation to have, and we have this conversation fairly frequently. At the same, and so I have to be honest. Many times I don't, I don't, have to, I don't think about it all that deeply. It's such a common conversation that, I, that it, it doesn't trigger sort of. But when I take a step back and think about it, I think you know if, if we go into the trial understanding that, that this is number one placebo controlled, and number two not a therapy, but an intervention for testing to see if it potentially in some cases we're only testing to see if it's safe and tolerable. Um, what is that? What does that conversation mean about the understanding of the patient as they enter the trial? So that's one of the that's one of the sort of phenomena that, that leads to this tension about therapeutic misconception. The other one is this. Um, we recently ran uh, a, a trial of autologous and mesenchymal peroxide stem cells um, in people with ALS. And uh, this was a, a, an industry sponsored study. Um, and study of stem cells. We were deluged with requests to enter the study. So much so that we had to hire a nurse to answer the phone, to answer questions about the study. Um, it was a sort of a phase 2A design. And calls came in from around the world, um, literally around the world, around the country, from loved ones and from, and from patients. And we had 16 slots, so you know, limited enrollment. That, that phenomenon of a very early phase trial whose primary outcomes were safety and tolerability, generating that kind of interest, um, and people People really, um, you know, putting, you know, saying, "Listen, I, you know, I'm dying of this disease. I need to be in this trial. This is my, life. This, is, this is my last resort." Uh, that sort of also kind of sets off this this question of what what is, is there therapeutic misconception, and, and, and is that what we're seeing? Um, so, there's, I think there's a lot more to say, but I but I think that the, we'll save the rest of it for discussion. James for that uh, introduction. I think I might have to skip over one slide when you talk about trial skipping. Is that
that right? But that's okay. Uh, we, can, we can talk about that in the, in the discussion if we need to. Um, okay, so thanks also to Toss for inviting me. Looking forward to um, talking to you a little bit about what I know about therapeutic misconception, and then also one other topic that I think is important to, or that I want to bring into the discussion around um, therapeutic misconception, which is optimism bias. And I'll say um, a bit about what that is um, in a moment. Um, so just quick outline for what I'm going to talk about. I just want to do a very brief overview. Dr. Kim is going to say a lot more about therapeutic misconception and sort of the research looking into it. Um, but I'll just sort of introduce the topic a little bit. What is therapeutic misconception? Why is this um, a serious problem for clinical research? Um, ALS trial skipping, I'll skip over that because we didn't talk about that, um, but we, we can come back to it. And then um, I want to transition to sort of contrast this idea of therapeutic misconception, which is to sort of locate in patient Optimism bias, which I think is a related phenomenon that is located in the clinical investigators. Um, too. It is intersect in an interesting way and an important way for understanding the ethics of trials and sort of where the burden of understanding ought to fall. Um, so I'll say what optimism bias is, why that's a serious problem, and how these things are related. Um, okay, so therapeutic misconception is a really um, sort of important <coughs> idea in research ethics that has generated a lot of attention. Authors have sort of taken this up, talking about words about patients who enroll in phase one cancer trials um, expecting any benefit when the likelihood of actually experiencing any benefit is very low. Um, but worries about what this means for models of competency, just how ubiquitous um, this problem is that so many patients go into studies with this idea that sort of there's a um, they're expecting some therapeutic benefit for themselves. Um, and you know it's a really popular and important topic when you sort of get you know. There are papers, there's like a body of literature that is actually talking about the body of literature that talks about the therapeutic misconception now as well. And so you know you know something important there. But I mean, so what is this idea? So in a nutshell, therapeutic misconception is this idea that research subjects fail to understand the purpose of the experiment that they are participating in, contemplating participating in, how that experiment deviates from what would happen to them in the context of clinical care, and some of the consequences perhaps of experimental design. So the classic one that we always talk about is randomization. So you'll sort of explain the process of randomization to participants who are going to enroll in the study, and you, know, you might end up being allocated a placebo arm or something like that. And then sort of there are studies where you follow up with these patients after you know they say, yes, I understand, you know, they signed the consent form, but they thought still that they were going to get, you know, be assigned the therapy that was the best for them. So this seems like um, a serious problem, you know, um, sort of at root, it really sort of calls into question the validity of informed consent. Bedrock ideas, one of the foundations of ethical research is that we need to get informed consent from participants. We want them to understand exactly what it is they are consenting to. And if therapeutic misconception is as common as some of these analyses suggest, then it appears to undermine these, these foundations. Um, okay, so pausing there momentarily, I mean I think there's some there's lots of more many facets to this problem. I mean, one of the pro issues that this sort of therapeutic misconception brings out for me is I think it sort of identifies really a difficulty with the notion of informed consent itself. So I think even setting aside therapeutic misconception, you might ask other questions about informed consent in ways that might be problematic. So for example, if we're sort of, we want to, it seems like kind of a robust, genuine notion of informed consent, we have to assume that the participants who are contemplating enrolling in studies have some measure of scientific literacy and numeracy um, I attended a, or sat, sat in on a conference last weekend that was all about science education, where there was a vigorous debate in sort of the you know science educator world about just how difficult it is to sort of on the one hand assess people's scientific literacy, but also to sort of get them, get sort of students, get the general population sort of to understand exactly what was on in science, and to understand the scientific results with all of their uncertainty. Um, informed consent also needs to assume. I think at least some familiarity with the realities of the research enterprise. So for example, therapeutic misconception, one of the sort of underlying, or one of the ideas that sort of if we become more familiar with what goes on in research and sort of just how many trials fail, how many experimental medications don't work for patients, how many negative results there are, right, that participants sort of don't understand that that's really the reality of clinical research, that most drugs that are put into clinical trials do not end up being found to be therapies. Um, so, insofar as they understand that, that's okay, but there's 
concerns that that, that sort of that reality is not widely appreciated. Um, at a more philosophical level, I think sort of you know important consensus built on this idea about autonomy and free will. And I won't sort of go in you know too deeply into the discussion today. We can talk about that more in the question period if people are interested in. But these are problematic concepts in and of themselves. Figuring out exactly well what is autonomy, where does autonomy come from? How do we know that people actually have autonomy? And the same thing with free will. These are debates that are thousands of years old. It's not clear to me there are actually sort of really good answers to those questions in philosophy, and yet sort of a robust notion of informed consent is in some way contingent upon having answers to those questions. And so as far as we have doubts perhaps about autonomy and free will, that's sort of again now what exactly is informed consent about. Um, I think sort of the answer to that becomes much more problematic. Um, so why rely so heavily then on informed consent um, in research? It seems to me that therapeutic misconception is really only a giant problem if we think informed consent is sort of a paramount ethical concern. If we don't have sort of true, robust informed consent, we're in, we're in big trouble in research. Um, but if we take a step back from that, I don't want to dismiss that idea entirely, but if we take a step back and instead think about sort of centering our ethical concern around, for example, minimizing harms and maximizing benefits to society, then I think there's another problem, optimism bias, that actually may be more problematic than therapeutic misconception. So what is optimism bias? So optimism bias is investigators misestimating parameters of their study design. So that would be things like they're overestimating the experimental interventions effect size, overestimating their capacity to recruit and retain participants in their study, potentially underestimating the time and resources needed to complete the study, underestimating the likelihood of harm to the participants. Um, so these are all sort of aspects that if we don't get these parameters correct, what you can end up with is an uninformative study at the end. And that's a serious problem. So there's a smaller body of literature that is actually trying to probe optimism bias and the extent to which um, trials are designed on the basis of unrealistic assumptions about effect sizes, about the capacity to recruit participants. Um, and in some, you know, they are, the way that this argument goes is insofar as sort of these are mistakes that could be identified before the trial is carried out. These are sort of failings of um, the research enterprise because we're getting inconclusive results on these things. We're failing to answer the question that we're interested in. Um, that means that we're failing to redeem the burdens that participants assume in terms of benefits in uh, general knowledge. This has been looked at in cancer studies, for example, where sort of the estimates of um, benefit are overestimated and you end up with an informative study. I also want to put this in context of a much larger debate that's going on in research ethics and the research community about um, waste and inefficiency research enterprise as a whole, looking at lots of studies um, that um, don't produce informative results, lots of programs that sort of fail to put all these resources into testing, drugs are sort of failing to get out of the research system, the sort of new therapies that we're interested in. And part of this is potentially explained by optimism bias. These are sort of mistakes that we could correct for to design, design better studies and get, get, get better results. Um, I've talked a little bit about this in an ethics piece where I argue um, one way that we could sort of get a better read on the extent of optimism bias would be to actually ask investigators to make explicit predictions about the likelihoods in their study. So when they're conducting this study, or they're submitting a protocol for review, they should actually make an explicit prediction of how likely it is that they think, for example, their study is going to you know, find a statistically significant result. How likely is it that they're going to close by the date that they say they're going to close a group of participants that they can recruit? Um, and then in doing this, by making explicit predictions, this actually becomes a modality not only for assessing whether or not investigators actually are systematically optimistic, but also then for the investigators themselves to improve over time. They start to get feedback and they realize, wait, you know, I'm consistently thinking that I'm going to see a bigger effect than I do. This is problematic not only for, you know, the harm it does to uh, sort of, yeah, to the, to the participants for sort of not contributing as much as they could in terms of scientific knowledge, right, so then they can sort of use this feedback to try to design uh, better studies, right? So how does optimism bias relate to the therapeutic misconception? Well, so at bottom, the point is that even a fully informed participant who enrolls in a study that is sort of not designed on the basis of kind of the most robust realistic parameters may be exposed to unnecessary and avoidable risks, and these burdens may never be redeemed by benefits to science. And so it seems to me that informed consent is an ideal, and it's an important ideal, but I think that what the therapeutic misconception gets at, what optimism bias gets at, it shows us that consent really can't do all the moral work. 
And so I want to leave you with sort of one final thought that I think, you know, alternative is to sort of think about really the goal in research, the goal is in, in, in getting consent from participants. It shouldn't be sort of this ideal, you know, information sort of, you know, absolute autonomy where they understand everything. They kind of make this, you know, fully rational decision theoretic kind of um, decision but rather is an alignment of scientific understanding and trust. It would look something like this. So the investigator is responsible to communicate faithfully what they believe to be true, not what they wish to be true about sort of, you know, um, the realities of, of the, the effects that they're likely to see, but sort of what they actually believe to be the case about the risks and benefits and the uncertainty that underlies their study. And that participants can choose to accept or reject that, those risks and uncertainty consistent with their knowledge and values. But I think just given the power of knowledge differential between the participant and the researcher, it's still the case that the participant is going to have to place some limit, some measure of trust. It is that there's not going to sort of ever be fully informed understanding of the realities. I shouldn't say there's not ever going to be that, but that's sort of, you know, that's really an ideal, right? But nevertheless, participants have to place some trust in the investigator and the research system to ultimately guarantee the risk benefit balance. So I believe there here are some references. But thanks. First, I want to say that I, I think uh, what Spencer did is definitely true. If I could summarize what he said, it's something like, you know, research design is a bigger ethical issue for research ethics than informed consent. And I think that's, I think in a really important sense that's true. Justifying whether a research is ethical is different from justifying whether participate of this person is ethical, and participation of that person is ethical. That's informed consent. Now today, I'm going to mostly restrict my talk to the informed consent aspect, um, centered around this notion of therapeutic misconception, because it is such a, you might say, a received view in the field that this happens all the time. You saw an article that says that ubiquity of therapeutic misconception. And it does tap into a very important ethical concern, but I think the way we traditionally have thought about it isn't as helpful as it could be. So that's going to be my brief. Um, that's the claim I'm gonna make. I apologize to some of you who have heard this parts of this talk. I've cut my hour talk to 30 minutes and we'll see how it works. So if there are gaps, you can always ask questions and we'll fill it in that during the discussion time. Okay. I have to say this because I work for the government. <laughs> Nothing I say is very important. <laughs> All right, so, you know, Dr. Berry mentioned some patients with what ALS who obviously are primarily motivated by getting therapy benefit out of being in research. And that really kind of makes people rightly so concerned because they really understand this is kind of an experiment, you know, that this works and at risk and so forth. So what we really want is somebody like this, right? Somebody who says this, I, this is one of my uh, interviewees, one of my studies, I feel an obligation to, you fill in the disease, this person had to have, happened to have Parkinson's. Parkinson's community that I need to do what I can do to improve a lot of the people. You know, I'm not a Washington person, I'm not a lobbyist, but I can't do those things, but I can participate in studies. I mean, this is what our, I mean, you know, this would make Ephesus happy, right? This person doesn't have their being this deception, we'd like to think. Correct? Okay. Now, however, this is what happens in the same interview. A few minutes earlier, this is what this person said. 
it didn't take long for me to decide that it was really the best thing for me to be in this study that we're talking about. There aren't too many other things I can try out there, you know, and I need to try some. Okay. So this sounds also like the kind of behavior and the concerns that uh, we just heard about. So what's going on? I guess my point, my whole talk is trying to explain this particular patient as a paradigm. Because for most people like me and Dr. Berry who have talked to patients with serious illnesses entering clinical research, this is not unfamiliar, okay? But we have to make sense of it. Which part of this person is really driving the decision, let's say, things like that, okay? So I will try to run through this and see how we do. Okay, we're gonna talk about some problems with the theory of conception and misconception as a concept. A uh, couple of issues, but mostly I'm going to give you some research, some explanations as to how to understand what sounds like a misconception with an alternative way of understanding what's going on. And that's gonna be a bulk of my talk. And then at the very end, I'm gonna just suggest some ways to think about this, what the actual problem probably is and how we can address it. Okay, so just an example, the way we think about for therapeutic conception is a little bit hard because there are many definitions out there. Spencer actually used one. Can I ask you which one that came from? Which, or was that your best summary of what you um, you didn't I sort of took it from your slides. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so I had a slide, a bunch of slides that I had to delete because I had enough time. But basically, it was kind of close. I mean, there were usually people mention things like, do they know they're in research, not treatment? Do they know that this is unlikely to benefit them? So false views about benefit. And then the individualization, lack of it in research. So those are the three elements usually. But this is what often happens. Primary example is uh, of a co common confusion in what I call the received view of a therapeutic misconception is something like this. If a research subject seems to be motivated by therapeutic benefit, that by itself is an indication something is wrong. That's commonly accepted. So motivation for participation is seen as part of it. Now, so I'm not making this up, there's a, there have actually been studies in which the measurement of TM is uh, done by using an instrument, an index, and one of the questions in that index is just this motivation question, okay? So that has been used, but that doesn't quite make sense, right? Motivation and understanding are different. So I did buy a lottery ticket for the first time in my life about a month ago. Do you remember that one billion dollar Powerball? <laughs> so, so my secretary sent, sent out an email, who wants to do it? So it turned out the only people who did it was me and my department head and our secretary. Everybody else was too rational. We have a lot of philosophers in our department. <laughs> and they said, this is an you know, exploitation of the poor and so forth. So they didn't want to do it, but we thought, hey, we might win. <laughs> so we bought it. So, Look, I knew it was one in 10 billion chance or whatever it is, but if you ask me why'd you buy it, of course, you know, to explain to sort of the decrease my shame, I had to, to say things like, well, you know, it gives me some entertainment value, you know, stuff like this. But you know, deep down, everybody thinks, hey, I have the same chance as everybody else, right? This is what people typically say. But I didn't, but I don't think that the lottery was designed to benefit. So the same thing happens, I think, with patients. Patients who are desperately ill often might sign up, and they will say, look, I'm doing it because I have a benefit. But do they actually misunderstand that it's just a specialized treatment, or do they think it's an experiment on which they're, they're willing to take a gamble? Sometimes I think people actually misunderstand. When I have spoken to one patient uh, in a uh, early phase Parkinson's study in which that was the case, but Usually, I don't think they really misunderstand it. It's not research. Okay. There's a lot of data about the presence of their misconceptions. So the people who've done this research, they typically cite like 60, 70 percent of people in research show some signs of their misconceptions. So that's sort of the that's the received view. 
I think the re one of the reasons is because the way this research is done. If a subject shows any evidence of TM that those people are counted as having TM, okay? And I'm not making this up because this is explicitly laid out in methods of the papers in which they do these studies. So for example, in this one paper it says, in keeping with our usual procedure, any clear evidence of TM was coded as TM present. Even as at, at some other point in the interview, the subject gave a contradictory response. So having seen my first slide, you'll see that person would automatically be categorized as somebody who shows TM. All right, so my thought is actually, well, why is this apparent contradiction? It seems to, it seems to me the agenda for research is to figure out why, this, why do people say these opposite sounding things, right? So there is a researcher at Duke named Kevin Weinberg who's really written some really nice papers trying to figure out what's going on and had some really nice studies. And I learned a lot from his work and I've designed some studies using his work. And that, that's just the point. People say different things. Instead of assuming they have TM, what's going on? So this is just an example in a study where they found half the people had TM. But if you look at one of the questions they used, which is this. You, you ask people, research is done to gain knowledge for future use. It may help the people who participated, but that is not the main goal of research. Pretty clear. If, we, if a person said, if a person had their being misconception, they should disagree, correct? Okay. So this question was asked in two different ways, positively like this and negatively, and you get the exact same result. The result looks like this. Overwhelming, almost nine out of 10 people answer correctly. However, this, you, there are many TM studies in which people get contradictory results. So if your rule of counting up people is that if there's any sign, then you can have very high numbers, right? Okay. In our studies, we find very few people who explicitly say, yeah, the primary purpose of this research is to benefit me. Now, people do say that, okay, it, given the way we ask this. So this is a qualitative interview, and we ask this person, ask people, is the primary goal of being in this study, and this study was a sham control Parkinson's uh, study. So either gene transfer or some type of modified cellular transfer study, okay? And we interviewed 89 people, so virtually everybody who was in, uh, or a subset of everybody, all the studies done at some time. Five people out of 89 actually said yes, it's intended to benefit me, the participant, right? Everybody else gives some combination. It's both, benefit science, create knowledge to benefit me, and some, some combination. But the top line, primarily intended to help subjects participating in the study. So it sounds like there's about 6% of people who really don't get it. Now what's interesting is this. In our qualitative interview, where it's semi-structured, we probe, go back and forth, we asked them questions about design of the study. We asked them to describe how many arms are there? What's the difference? If you're in one arm, what do they get? If you're in the other arm, what do you get? Why do they have those two arms? What's the nature of those arms? What's the purpose? We asked all those questions. So that's how, let's see how those five people did, okay? Who said what? Primarily intended to help subjects participate. This is what we find. Method of assignment, which is randomization. Four people got it correct. One person said, not sure. Probability of placebo assignment. I'm talking about the exact number. Uh, not every study was 50-50, so I can't remember exactly, but you know. One person got it incorrect, not because they thought it wasn't randomized, but they gave a wrong number, okay? Yeah, one in eight. Purpose of the sham arm. Everybody got that correct. In fact, four of the five people gave us a, kind of a mini lecture on the fact that in Parkinson's disease, placebo effect is a particular problem because of the dopamine system, right? So, four, and all five understood why you needed the placebo arm. And they also were able to describe the procedural differences. So, it's very hard for me to believe that their response to this question in combination with this says that these five people don't know 
that they're in a research study, really a scientific study. Okay, I, I find that really difficult to believe. Now, <coughs> should we label these people as TM? Okay, what are the alternative explanations? Why might some people say that the primary purpose is to help the participants? So why do they say that? I mean, that, that wasn't just ticking a box. That was in a conversation. We were going back and forth, and the people actually said this. So why would they say that? <clears throat> so one option is people really can't tell the difference between a research study and getting treatment. Now, this is the conventional TM view. And, I, you know, it's, it's a pretty startling, I mean, claim. It's a pretty strong claim, and we don't really appreciate that as much as we should, I think, sometimes. The question we use to measure TM doesn't work well. That's the second alternative. So maybe we're not quite measuring what we think we're measuring when people say these things. Okay, so that's another hypothesis. So my natural question was, how do participants interpret the question used to measure TM? And this is what we did. We, at the time we were developing this, we looked for the latest study on TM. And there was a paper by uh, Becky Pence, who's a bioethicist at uh, the Cancer Center associated with the name of the St. Jude's? St. Jude's? No, in Atlanta. Uh, so anyway, she published this paper in which she used this question to people with cancer entering cancer trials. She asked them, is the research study that you're in mostly intending to help research and gain knowledge or mostly intending to help you as a person? When she did that with 90, asked that question of 95 people uh, who were entering oncology clinical trials, almost 40% said mostly intending to help me as a person. <coughs> So that's worrisome because that, that's they're sort of doing what my five people did, right? And when you combine it with another question she used, she found the typical close to 70% presence of therapeutic misconception. Now, how did the respondents interpret the question? That's the question we had, right? So what we did was we just thought, well, why don't we ask them? We'll, we'll ask people the question, and then after they answer, we'll go. Which of the following do you think best captures how you understood the question? Now, we developed this in two ways, and I'm just going to give you the actual closed-ended options that we used. One option was, okay, the question was asking you about your personal motivation, why you wanted to be in the study. Or it was asking about knowledge for knowledge's sake versus actually helping people. Because, you know, the way they phrased it, I thought it was confusing. Maybe people thought that was the case or it was asking about the official purpose of the study. Now, what we did was we started by actually just getting a convenient sample of people on the internet because we wanted to figure out how people understand the language of these things. So we had a one-page description of ALS, about like the way you described it, really. Terrible, terrible disease, most people die, it happens fast, there isn't really a treatment that changes things, basically. So, and we asked them, well, here's a phase one study, and we gave the background, and asked them if they would be willing to participate. And you know, when you give them this very grim picture of what ALS is, the lay person who reads this and already goes, yeah, I consider being a study. And so everybody's, uh, we get them in that therapeutic mindset, even with lay people on the internet. So, total number of people we have the 234. The way we did it was two stage. One was we actually randomized people on the first group of 100 and had them answer open-ended so we could uh, uh, validate or closed end options for the follow-up questions. And then after we did that study, we had a second survey, but I'm gonna just give you the entire shebang in one, one table. Okay. All right, this is what we found. This is kind of complicated, so let me just walk you through it. So the top row is answers to the, you can keep in mind, let's call it the purpose of research question, right? What is the purpose of research that you're in? The column, the far left, 
is answer to the follow-up, how did you interpret that question, okay? All right, so if you do a cross-tabulation, this is what you find. You have only about 52% of the people say, oh, what they were asking me was what the official purpose of the study was, okay? About 24% thought they were being asked, or at least they have self-reported, was asking me why I'd want to participate. And then the middle 24% chose this option. This was kind of a red herring option that we gave, which is, oh, we're asking about knowledge, knowledge sake versus you know, helping people as people. <coughs> Long and the short is only about half the people understood it as intended. Now, if you look at this one, this column, this column is people who gave the TM answer, right? Because to the question, what's the purpose? They answered help me as a person, correct? About 15% answer that, 35. But notice, if among those people, if you understood the question as intended, only three out of the 35 actually understood it as intended, okay? All right. So I'm gonna summarize this in, the, in this slide. 48% failed to understand the TM question as intended. Out of everybody, only 1.3% kind of showed true TM, meaning understood how the question was meant to be understood, and said, yes, it's to help me as a person. 1.3%. Now, granted, these are people without the disease, and they're just sort of doing the hypothetical. And as I said, 91% of those people who apparently show TM actually didn't interpret the purpose question as intended. Now, 93% of those who interpret the question as intended give the correct answer. Okay, all right. So we can skip the last point. I, that's just the theoretical framework I used to do this study. Okay. What we did then was to recruit people with ALS because it, you know, obviously these are just, the first study was people, MTurk. Anybody do a survey in MTurk? But anybody know what that is? It's an Amazon service, you know, it's like, uh, what do you, what's the, Raul, what's the term for that? Uh, crowd something. Yeah, like the crowdsourcing. Yes. People doing like little work jobs. That's right. Yeah, yeah. So you know, you can have people proofread your papers. You know, and you just pay them like sixty cents or something. But you do that on Amazon. So that's what we use. So you think that's not a good sample? So what we did was we recruited people through various research recruitment portals at University of Michigan, University of Rochester, and some up in the Northeast uh, patient uh, advocacy sites. Yeah. I forget the name, name but we they, we advertised there, and they said, if you're interested, in contact us. And then 72 people actually went through the internet survey and answered this. And you essentially get very similar results, as you can see. About 15% say, yeah, it's to help me as a person. But if they understood it as, oh, they're asking what the official purpose of the study is, only one out of those about 10 people had that. Okay. So the results are pretty similar. I'd like to say that if you exhibit therapeutic misconception, at least for the purpose of research, that's a much better indicator of you're having misunderstood the question than it is that you have therapeutic misconception. Right? Okay, now what are the alternative explanations? So we've done studies using these experimental formats, but before that, we did a lot of qualitative interviews. And I'm just gonna give you some quotes from those just to get a flavor for what we think is happening. So apparent TM statements regarding one and one randomization. So we asked them, you know, uh, what's the chance that you would get randomized or you would get either placebo or the real gene therapy for Parkinson's. And you hear comments like this, well, it's hopefully it's better than 50, 50. No, 50-50 was actually the correct answer, okay? Or they would say things like, well, if I don't get one, the gene transfer, I'm going to be really surprised. Now, 
This is exactly the kind of codes you get when you interview people in research studies. It's common. That's why we, we talk, talk about ubiquity of review this conception. Now, what's interesting is this. You put it in context, and this is what the context of that quote is, so I kind of cheated. <laughs> Hope. Well, hopefully it's greater than 50-50, but statistically it isn't. It's English. Most of you kind of understand what this person's saying, right? But it's not mathematical language, right? Okay. Or how about this other person? If I don't get one, I'm going to be surprised. I've got a lot of people praying for me, a lot of people believing, and I think I'm going to be, I'm going to go in there hoping with a positive attitude I'm going to get one. That's what he means by going to be surprised. How about luck? So we've covered hope, faith, luck. The subject 12, I'm going to be the other half. You're going to be the other half? Yeah. You feel pretty sure about that? Real thing. I'm pretty sure. Now, what's the context? My wife is convinced that I'm going to get the real thing. She says, I have a feeling. I'm going with that. That sounds good to me. So you have to understand the whole context of why people are saying that. Consider subject 11 who correctly stated that probability of randomization in the study was 50%, either placebo or the gene transfer. He later says this, My, uh, our interviewer says, do you think you have a better than 50% chance of getting the gene transfer? I hope so. Uh, he, he, we know he gets it because he stated it just previously. Now, TM theory would say that this is an example how people understand in the abstract, but when it comes to their own situation, people don't understand it. That's been the traditional interpretation that, yeah, people will give you the right answer, but when it comes to their own situation, they don't get it. Well, now, this is what he says later in the interview. Um, Do you think you have a better than 50% chance, which I read already? He says, I hope so. Now, the full context is, I'm good, I'm a gambler, I like my odds, I'm a good guy too, so you know, I figure I'm lucky. You feel in general you're lucky, and it might be the same way here. Yes, I feel pretty lucky. And that's when I, I got the quote, you see. So like I said, I feel lucky. So people <coughs> will often say things like that, because whatever luck means, luck is a very slippery concept. I tried to, in fact, there's actually a whole philosophical word by Nicholas Rescher on luck. I tried to read it, I got really confused because it's, it's not an easy concept. We all use it intuitively in the right moments, but trying to theorize about it is very difficult. Can I ask if they believe in evolution? <laughs> and there's a huge percentage of our population who don't even believe in science. Do you make sure they oh. believe in science? Oh, I see. Yeah. So you, you think these people are kind of still not. So we well, we're going to get to that. So maybe some people feel that hope, faith, luck are all irrational kind of manifestations. So we can have a conversation about that. Okay, great. Thanks for the point. So social norms and how we talk, I, I think it's actually, I'm going to propose how to understand these statements. A typical statement during a sports interview, unless you're a non-evolutionary sports person, I guess, or whatever. So this is, I don't know, what city am I in? Boston. Okay, so, <laughs> all right, so when the Celtics were playing the Cavaliers last year, anybody remember that? Okay. <laughs> Come on. So, you've got my favorite coach in this city. He's a terrific coach. Anyway, okay. So, no, you know, no one really thought the Celtics were going to win. But if Brad Stevens, the coach, had said during an pregame interview, well, you know, we've been practicing really well. I think we have a good chance at an upset. Well, you understand that, right? Have you ever have you ever heard something like this from a sports <laughs> person on an interview? You have, right? Okay. Note that as a statistical statement, this makes no sense, right? Because if you put it literally, this is what it means. There is a high probability of a low probability that that happened. <laughs> That's what it means, literally. Okay. So it seems to me we accept a certain kind of irrationality in our language, but it's still rational because there are certain conventions we follow. In fact, 
this is what these psychologists in Germany have stated in studying um, these kind of phenomena. What they say is this. Adhering to social norms is rational, although it conflicts with classical rationality defined by many research as adherence to the laws of probability theory and logic. So a lot of the um, behavioral economics experiments, you know, people that show that people kind of use heuristics that get them into all these different kinds of, some of those can be explained, I believe, by the fact that the people answering are, the, are being very rational. It's just that they're following different rules of the conversation than what the psychologists are intending when they ask those questions. Okay, so what we did with this ALS sample was ask the following question too, just to follow up about the notion of you know, uh, expectations of benefit. Because one of the things that's often talked about in therapeutic misconception is also this view that people have really falsely inflated estimates of benefit and they minimize the chance of this. Okay, that's the view. So, in fact, if you ask cancer patients who are into clinical trials, they often say, oh, you know, I don't know, 60%, 70% chance of my cancer getting much better. And that sounds a large pot, right? Because it doesn't correspond to reality. So when we asked that question to the sample of people with actual ALS, we gave them this scenario that sounded very scientific understandable in late terms. They said an average estimate was 31%. I thought it was actually lower than what I expected, but still pretty high. I mean, if I said to Dr. Berry here, just like what Spencer said you should do, you know, you're asking for money to do research, I want you to put your bet down and tell me what's the probability that people in this research study would benefit. I bet you would not say 30%. You would give a much lower number, right, usually. Okay. So this is what happened. So we asked a follow-up question. So after they gave the number, we said, okay, we're gonna give you some statements. We gave them in random order. Which statement below best describes your responses to your estimate question? And this is what they say. You see the pattern is pretty obvious. There are There is one group that gives a really high number on average, okay? And those are the people who chose, that is what I hope will happen, and it's important to have a positive attitude. People who gave much more realistic low numbers were the ones who chose the following responses. Those are just the facts. Or that's what I fear will happen, which makes sense. And then people say, you know, there's just a lot of uncertainty. And those people only gave much lower estimates. So I think we have, this is an indication that we really have to understand that we're communicating on the same page because there's different planes of communication. When you have a fatal disease and you're struggling, I mean, every day is a battle. You gotta beat this thing. Your language changes. And when we stand in front of them, so to speak, and then expect people to use the same logic that we do, I think sometimes we can get into trouble. So, now hope, based on false or misleading information should be minimized. So one of my pet peeves in informed consent forms for phase one studies is when they say, it is not guaranteed that you will benefit. Right? Because what does that say? Well, you're gonna benefit, yeah, I just can't guarantee it. What's kind of, and, and I've actually, this, this bothered me so much, I actually did an empiric experiment testing this. And it's true, if you give this statement versus kind of a factual statement saying, you know, this is an experiment, there's a possibility you could benefit, but it's low. Okay, if you compare the responses of estimates, the numbers go way up if you use this. So we should minimize that. I think that's, no one's gonna about that. But here's getting back to what we talked about here, is that what about hope based on other factors, feeling lucky, faith, general views about science. Some people have very glowing views, you know. You wouldn't be sitting in these beautiful buildings if somebody didn't really reach into their pockets and really had good feelings about science that gets done here. No, seriously. So, now the problem is this. Almost by definition, this kind of hope and desires that come from it, almost by definition beyond the level of what the data will bear. I mean, it's almost part of the definition of hope, really. 
Yet it's compatible with appreciation and understanding of the actual facts. It's research. You know, the chances of actual benefit. Just like I can understand what the, the odds of winning a lottery are. And it is possible to exploit this hope. That's where I think the danger is. Right? But I do think it's also not good to stigmatize people, research subjects, for wanting something for themselves out of it. I remember when I gave this talk in front of research uh, participants, one of the comments that struck me was that they said, you know, I feel like I'm getting stigmatized for wanting something out of being in the study. Okay. All right. I mean, really, why are we talking about informed consent? I think that unless we understand why this bothers us, the remedy that we suggest will be the wrong one. So if the problem is seen as misunderstanding what's going to happen, well, we need to put more detail into the consent forms. We have to inform them better. We have to, you know, and then the whole thing escalates into an education issue, not an issue about how to communicate, about seeing things from the subject's perspective. So I'm just going to cl close with a couple practical tips. One. If you read the federal regulations about um, informed consent, it has all these elements that have to go into it. Nowhere does it ever say you should ask your research subjects why they want to be in your study. It's not, it's not required. I personally think that every researcher who enrolls a subject should sit down and ask them. I've explained it. You said you want to be in it. Can you tell me in your own words why you want to be in the study? And what's going to happen? The very can tell you, Doc, there's nothing out there. I really want something. Now, to me, that's a beautiful opportunity to juxtapose their motivation with your understanding of what the purpose of research is. Right? That moment, you can say, I understand that's what really driving you, and it's very understandable given the situation. But let me take this opportunity to understand, to explain why we're doing this study and some of the priorities that we have that you should understand before you sign up. If people will sign up after that, I, you know, I'm not worried about this misunderstanding of the purposes. Okay, second practical tip is we found, we found that there's some hint that people who are really motivated by their benefit, their big benefit, tend to be actually savvier about the risks of the study than people who say they have an altruistic motivation. Okay, it was, It's not a robust effect, but now in retrospect it makes sense because we've been so <coughs> focused on this idea that people shouldn't be motivated by benefit when they enter studies. We don't, we fail to see the whole context, which is if you're really motivated to get something out of it, then you're going to look at all signs and say, and say, well, is this worth it? So there's the flip side, which is that people who are really, really think, oh, I'm at Harvard Medical School, doc, and I, and I want to contribute to science and so forth. You do whatever you want. I trust you. I think those people could have an altruistic misconception because they don't bother <laughs> listening to what, what the details are. You know, Maybe there's some risk that they, if they really took the time to understand, they might have want to be in the study. Okay. So the papers and everything, it's at the website. These are my colleagues who helped me over many years do this work. Thanks. Thank you all very much. This is this, uh, really fascinating to me. I, I take care of the patients with ALS too, and just last week I sent somebody to to James, uh, who I, I worried had either the therapeutic misconception or the subject's version of an optimism bias, right? So, so the type of optimism bias that Spencer has talked about is, is on the researcher's side. But I, I still worry that she has a sort of optimism bias uh, that, Scott, you, you kind of expressed as a, a type of rationality that comes out as hope or faith or luck, um, and it, and I'm, I'm very reassured. You know, you've helped me 
reconceptualize therapeutic misconception, but I still have this nagging worry about that optimism bias that the subject has, and I, I still don't know how I feel about how strongly to fix it for her, right? Um, you know, when it comes to the lottery, my favorite joke is that the lottery is a tax on people who don't know how to do math. Um, I, and, and for you, I don't mind if you spend a few bucks on the lottery, but for people who don't have any money, you know, I feel like I need to protect them against that, that hopeful feeling that you are tempted to describe as a type of rationality. Similarly here, there's some amount of protection that I think we, I want to yeah. sort of extend to subjects so that their, their thoughts of hope don't mislead them, right? And so I don't know what the right level is there. And maybe, maybe James, you've got some, some concrete suggestions about how to actually approach these discussions. Yeah, so this is such, I mean, it's such an interest. There's a, there are a thousand things are running through my, my head in the conversation. This, this is about some of them. One of the, <clears throat> so I sort of draw from my own experiences as, as well when I, when I think about this. And I, I think about, um, I, so I think, I think honestly early when I started consenting people in trials, I felt very strongly that what I should be doing is making sure that they can tell me and believe and understand the actual chance that this is going to help them. And it's got to be, you know, they've got to tell me it's 2% or lower, and they've got to believe it. <laughs> and um, I don't think that's true anymore, because I, because I think that, that there's a part of us that's guided by hope. And this probably ties deeply into what we call survival instinct. And, and this is the reason that, you know, you see a horror movie, and at the end, there's still one protagonist running away from the monster when everybody else is going to it would be so much easier. It's, I think it's deeply built into who we are to have hope. And, and I don't think that it's at all beneficial to go in and, and sort of scoop that out. Um, I, just, I just don't see it as helpful. I do think that, that people can have both sides, of the ration, both sides of the conversation, the rational conversation and the hope conversation. And I've, I've taken to, I think I told this, I've taken to, to being overt when I consent to people and say, we're allowed to be hopeful about this experiment, but we are not allowed to expect benefit. There's no expectation that there'll be benefit. I don't know if that does it justice or not, but it at least throws out that there, that there are two sides to this, that there overtly is hope and expectation and they're different. Um, and I, I, yesterday, I told a patient that I was coming here to talk about this, and he was, he was in, a, in a trial, actually, and uh, we were talking about it, and I said, you know, we're, we're going to talk about this thing called therapeutic misconception, which is that the idea that, that uh, people enter trials and, and think that the trial is a treatment, that, that they individually will, will benefit from the trial. And he said, yeah, we all think that. <laughs> I said, oh. <laughs> Uh, and I said, um, oh, but but it's a like in this trial, it's an experiment, and we don't we don't know if you're going to get the drug, and we don't know if the drug is is helpful. And he said, you're right. <laughs> uh, and I said, okay. <laughs> I, mean, I, I really, I mean, I was like, I don't know where to take this conversation, but but um, but he said, no, we 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 all hope that we're going to. And I, I said to you, think or you hope. He said, no, well, I understand. And he, he laid out the trial and everything we talked about in the consent. But I think I'm going to back it. And I, th I mean, I think he's using the word think and hope, and I think he's, he's using them interchangeably. Um, but I think that's very interesting. Yeah. You know, can I just add something yeah. to what you said? So one, I thought, you know that slide I had, that at hope slide? I have like probably 20 different versions of that because every time I have to give a talk, I rethink, you know, how do I categorize this and so forth? I used to do it by separating hope and expectation. And I, at one point I thought, the way to do it is to go to the dictionary and find out what that they truly mean. <laughs> so I went to every single dictionary I could find and wrote it down and gave it as a quiz to people. You know, the problem is that definitions of those so similar. <laughs> no. Uh -oh. <laughs> I used to quiz people at talks 
goes, this is hope or expectation, expect. And I would read the definitions. You would think that everybody would get it right. They don't. It's just that it's a, this, we don't have precise language. It's like there's a context and who you're talking to that could make a difference. I mean, for example, if that, that patient, what makes it really difficult is that he's a scientist talking to a patient, okay? If that patient you were just talking to that sounded worrisome what they were saying, if you thought that patient was talking to another patient that they were talking, and you could tell they were just trying to pump each other up, so to speak, you wouldn't think twice and get worried about, as worried, let's say. Right. So it's very complicated. I, I, I guess what I'm not trying to say there is no problem, so to speak. What I'm saying is that I think to simply assume based on some of these observations that people misunderstand, that they're not getting, is what, what's, I think that's the long way to go. Because then the, uh, what's the remedy? I mean, suppose you just give them the information, they go, uh -huh, okay. Now you have the problem. Did they really understand it or not understand it? So. That's the, the other thing is, I think, I mean, I really struggle with just the idea of probability. Let's, I, I remember thinking very, thinking about this very deeply when I, I was a resident and I had a patient who needed a cardiac enterectomy. I think he may have been symptomatic with a tiny stroke. I can't remember whether he might have, he's either asymptomatic or very, very tight cardiac or he was just had a tiny stroke. And we talked about the, the, the risks, uh, you know, the, the risks of the uh, intraoperative stroke. Say it's five percent, and 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 unfortunately, it happened. He had an intraoperative op op stroke. And he was very, 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 very angry. <laughs> and I know that I had a conversation with him. That the surgeons had a conversation. That the attending had a conversation. No, I mean, I was I was in or around those conversations. But it occurred to me that on a population basis, you can put a probability on things. But when you're an individual, it either happens or it doesn't happen. Right? And so. The understanding of probability is really, really hard, <laughs> and and so I don't even know how to. I, I just think it's it's, it's a, even that simple concept is really. Hard. So we'll take some questions from the audience. Uh, if if you ask a question, please try and uh, speak loudly because the microphone for the webcam is here on the table, and if you're soft, we may want to re repeat the question. Well, first of all, thanks to all three of you for what a great conversation. It's got my imagination just spinning. Um, but after listening to all this, I want to ask you just a, maybe about a, just a more direct way of going at this that seems to be honest, but more direct. So, James, I mean, what if you said to a patient, you know, I'm an expert in this disease. Uh, we're interested in this new medication. Um, I think it might work. It's gone through animal studies, and it's, it's, it's been very promising. And we have a study going on. Um, we do have a, a rule, our, our government has a rule though, that before we can distribute this widely, we need to prove that it works. And we haven't proved that it works yet or, or even that it doesn't do more harm than good. Um, so you know, the deal is that you're gonna have to agree to go into a situation where you got a 50-50 chance of getting it or not. You know, I kind of hope that you will be in the group that gets it, but you gotta understand I have no control over that. Um, and uh, what's wrong with that conversation? I mean, it, it I don't think there is, so I would say that that's actually much more rosy a picture than I paint when I consent people. Um, you know, and because um, there are a few words in there that I think are, are, are fine, but I tend, I try to maybe avoid them or, or be a little more explicit about them. How, what, if, what makes it, what makes it there promising? What does that mean to be promising? What percent? You would not be doing this if you didn't think the word promising. You're spending an enormous part of your time and career doing this. No, I think that's right. You do believe it's promising. That's just being right. honest. But it, that, so, well, Bob, do you have the therapeutic misconception? Well, this is, I mean, this is why I think maybe we're just, we're just thinking of it the wrong way. Well, so I think that what you said, I, I don't, I don't take huge issue with anything you said. I, I try to be a little more factual because I probably do have optimism bias. I'm a researcher at Research ALS. Probably do. I try to, I mean, I, I think that we try to keep that in check by having lots of reviews of a, of a project before it goes forward. Um, and, and honestly, I think we'd all probably just 
I, I think we all, I, I told you in the beginning, I think hope is deeply ingrained in what motivates us to do anything. Uh, and so I, I don't really have a huge problem with it. I, I think that basically is the conversation we have. And I, and I, also, I, I also said in the beginning to Toss, I used to worry about it a lot more than I do now. Because I've also had the experiment, the, the experience of going back to the people who've been in a trial that didn't show positive results more times than I would like to say we didn't see results and you were on the placebo anyway. Um, and it's disappointing. But I mean, nobody has ever, you know, strangled me with a phone cord. I, you know, like I, it, it's disappointing. It is. It's disappointing. Well, disappointing if a trial isn't, isn't positive. And, and we did go into it with some hope. Um, and we, we balance that against the reality that this is a tough not to crack. So I don't worry too much about it. Uh, I, this is such an interesting conversation. I, I both uh, do research and I do ethics work and I also work on ALS. Um, I, so many things. One is that you know people go to Vegas with way worse odds of getting a placebo and they are still hopeful about themselves. I think one question you could ask is, you know, to distinguish between faith, hope, and, and probability is like, well, do you think you're going to get the drug, James, saying? And James like, oh, I, I think I'm going to be lucky. He's like, well, do you think the guy in the, across the hall that's going to come in here next, is he going to get it? He's like, well, I don't know. I mean, the, everybody's hopeful about themselves because everybody in the, is in the slot machine just pulling the lever. Like, they are going to be the one. They're going to be the lucky one out of everybody. So I think the question about whether you're going to get it or not is, is sort of meaningless. Whether you're going to be lucky or not, is it? And and the second thing is, these people are going to die from ALS. Who cares what they think? I really don't understand. I mean, it's not a. We're not trying to find a different painkiller. Like you were asking people, should they um, should they feel lucky or not lucky? Their alternatives, like, yeah, I really feel like I'm not going to get a drug that will help me. And then all you guys are wasting all your time. You know what? I might as well just go home and die now because there's no hope. You're giving. There's no alternative. There's not really a rational thing. When you talk about rationality, there's no rational reason to think that um, you have no hope of getting help because the, your alternative is to go home and die the normal way. So the only reason they're even talking to James or any of you in front of her trial is because they are hopeful. They, they think that Harvard or NGH is going to do something great and maybe they'll be able to help themselves or somebody else, but I, I don't really understand the who cares if they're hopeful. So maybe I wouldn't put it I think I'm paraphrasing what you, have, what you said. And I think it relates very much to what Al Spencer put it at the beginning, which is that the real issue really, it seems to me, is society entrusts researchers, reviewers, you know, IRBs, and various committees that because we know about this bias, among other biases, Right? We didn't talk about careerist biases and all these other things that can come into play. People aren't just allowed to decide for themselves what they can offer people. It has to be, you literally, you have to have committees reviewing it. In fact, when I used, used to do a lot of research with people who went to gene transfer, the poor gene transfer clinical researchers, they had to, I mean, they had so many committees they had to go through. It took years before the conception to actual implementation was just incredible. So, so what I'm saying is this, I think our society has set up a system that's supposed to work something like this. You know, we really need to set up this system so that when we invite people, it's already not an unreasonable bet, okay? So that is set up, and then we also have this thing called autonomy that we really like to talk about in bioethics, which is something like, well, they're adults, they make decisions, it could harm them, it could not benefit them, so forth, but within the parameters we set aside, you have as honest a conversation as possible. How they actually process it, is it, do they believe in evolution or not? Do they believe in luck, is that irrational? We're, we basically made a decision as a society, the society seems to make to say, well, to that person, if you could say it's the libertarian angle to the informed consent, you know. So that seems to be what we're sort of doing. I think it's still, though, given that we're all part of the helping profession, 
when we consider the possibility that people who may not have wanted to be in the study might be in it because they would just had it like this, they go, that does bother people. And that's why I think this whole thing about your misconception is such a big issue. But I think what I said is very compatible with what you're saying, right? So I have to say that the, the conversation in ALS is actually, in the, in the patient case, is beginning to move back toward the, the first part that you said, which is, the, which is sort of how we define how we define the parameters for what is accept, an acceptable bet to begin with. To offer. Okay, to offer people. Yeah, like, in other words, people with ALS are saying, listen, I'm, I'm consenting to the stuff you're bringing to me, but you're not being aggressive enough. You're not allowing me to make a big enough risk benefit trade off. Right? And, and, and you, I mean, you, the, the lots of all the, the, the system. And the FDA takes the brunt of that, but there, I think there's, there's lots and lots of steps in that system. Grants and IRBs and FDA. And, you know. But that seems like, I mean, that, that to me is more worrisome than the hope. Where it's like people going and hope that doesn't, I agree that I don't think that's particularly problematic. I mean, for part of what we've been saying today, but that would, like, that does seem problematic though. When people are saying, like, I want to take a bigger risk than you're allowing, unless, you know, un under the presumption that they don't have the expertise to really understand sort of the extent of that risk or sort of what the science, I mean, if they understand the scientific reality. And then they want to consent to it. That's one thing. And then it seems like that would be a situation where you really want to make sure that they do appreciate exactly what what it is that they're asking for. I think you want to. If any, so there's yeah. yeah I mean, you have to kind of unpack that into when you have a project in front of you and you're consenting them to it. Again, I think it's very. It's a, I do not think you want to stop by hope. I do think you want to be realistic about the risks. Of it. I mean, because there are patients who say, "Oh, I didn't realize that risk came with it," and actually, you know, that doesn't fit into my life. I mean, I have a very bad disease, but this summer, I'm, I, my daughter's getting married, right? and I, I just, I don't want to put that much risk before that day. And so, so I think, I think people are doing that calculation if you're doing, if you're doing this right, and if you want them to. I think that's really important. But, and, and then what they're saying is, look, you know, some people are saying, I, I, I'll take even more risk if, if you can attach that to the same or better benefit. Uh, you know, or uh, chance of benefit. Um, and and we, it's true that our systems are not are, are only set up to scale risk benefit a little bit. So if you're researching neuropathy uh, and you're researching ALS, the risk benefit ratios are, are, are not allowed to be that much different for those two diseases. You don't have a mechanism for that. And, and our patients say, wait a minute. You know, I think actually the risk benefit ratios maybe should be balanced for you. If, if we have historical examples, I mean, when people were researching treatments for HIV, I think the researchers view that oh, we know how to do this ourselves. It's kind of it's a very severely challenged, and FDA had to make different rules about how to move drugs and so forth. So I think it, it, I think that they have people have to be we have to be careful that some of the scientific decisions I in implicit and very potent value judgments that you make. So because every design that you have, um, Bob and I have talked about the support study where you know you think you NICU and infants were involved. When they set up a study, that was to test to see what level of oxygen would be least harmful, that most beneficial. The designers of that study had to make a choice, which was, what is the margin of error in terms of mortality? Are we going to are we going to tolerate before we start to detect it if there is a difference between two alarms? So, and you know, I can tell you, that parents who are entering their children's studies like that might have different views than researchers who have very other various other considerations because they don't want to have a study with 10,000 people, which is going to be too expensive, they can't get it done, it'll be too complicated. So their incentive is to make it as small as possible and tolerate fairly big margins before they start detecting something really bad happening, okay? But 
research subjects might have a different view. So in that case, I think the design itself sounds scientific, but embedded in it is a hugely important moral question about what trade of is worth it if my child unfortunately has to be in a situation like that, they have to make a choice. So I think it's both. Thank you very much for the wonderful presentations. I just want to ask you a question regarding, as a, as a doctor, as a researcher, as a bioethicist, what is the fundamental ethical problem that you see with a misconception? Obviously, you, you highlighted clearly that it's all about the important concern. So the patient is coming in with the attitude that something is there that isn't truly there for them, then you're, you're recruiting people that shouldn't be there, or ideally they'll make an alternative decision to not participate. However, I mean, let's consider your ultimate goal to have that the most ideal research participant on that emphasis is to have an altruistic, you know, research guinea pigs. I mean, that's, that's the alternative. You want participants are there, fully understand that this could not benefit them, and they're still willing. Like that number three in, in Dr. Kim's presentation, you know, the three, four percent that understood the question and yet still gave a TM response that they're still willing to do. So, isn't is there any difference between your research participants, or is it just for the conscious mind to be? As a doctor, for example, you're happy that this patient is in because they understand and yet they still make a decision. What's the difference between the first patient, which is a naive lay member has not understood the whole purposes, but it's all hopeful and keen to participate, as opposed to someone who has understood exactly what you say and yet still making a decision that no rational person would actually make it. Obviously, the thing and the, the little hindsight is that have patients in ALS, which the alternatives are, you know, we're not talking about people that are fully healthy going to research, it's about Someone has got no other way out, shall we say. Do you find yeah. the question is that well, isn't so the ethical dilemma the second one as well? I, I guess I think I guess I would say that the, the what we want to avoid so that the reason that we all get a little uncomfortable when we talk about shifting how much risk people the risk benefit that people are willing to accept. Is this, at least one of the one of the reasons and I you know, I only spend a little time thinking about it. Um, but, but I mean, one of the reasons is this idea that, that people are vulnerable. So, so another phenomenon that we see a lot of in ALS is stem cell clinics or you know, snake oil cells. And, and, and I personally want to draw a very bright line between me and them. And the way that I can draw a very bright line try to be as clear about what we're doing as possible. And what we know and what we don't know and, and what the potential risks are and what, you know, what's the potential for that. Because if, if, if I don't spend time saying, we, we don't really know that there's a benefit to this. Or in fact, if I, if I did the reverse and said, I want to do something that's going to help. There is no difference. It seems like the, the fundamental ethical concern in TM and maybe in, in overly optimistic subjects is exploitation, right? The snake, the snake oil salesman is exploiting yeah. their hope, right, for personal gain. The researchers could exploit, you know, the misunderstanding or the overly hopeful patient in order to get their research study done. Right. And in order to prevent that exploitation, we need to come up with some way of yeah. either minimizing their hope without eliminating it, you know. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, right. I, mean, I don't. Again, I would. I, I think understanding and hope can be divorced, and I, I, I maybe I'm wrong about that. But some of this actually really comes from personal experience. I, you know, my my sister called me one day and said I have ovarian cancer. I said I'm gonna be okay. I mean, that's crazy. That's a crazy thing to say to somebody with ovarian cancer because that's a very bad disease. I don't know the numbers about ovarian cancer, but that was my immediate reaction, right? I if she, I mean. I didn't say it because I was saying, you know, gosh, I know that these numbers, I'm, I know I can get you into that group that's going to survive. I, I just, I just wanted to be nice. I, I'm just wondering if, um, given that um, and the, this, a lot of this is about communication and understanding, um, if in the consent process might not the, um, this optimism bias be kind of a useful tool to be right up front about the existence of an optimism bias? Might that not be a way to communicate this? 
I think that's right. I mean, my ideal picture would be, or I think an ideal world, what you would really want are participants. You don't want to sort of participants who aren't hopeful or optimistic, but I think you want them to really understand what sort of the underlying uncertainty that sort of characterizes this whole point for doing the research in scientific enterprise, right? And so, yeah, you can go in and sort of educate them. Part of consent could be explaining what optimism bias is, what therapeutic misconception is for that matter, right? And just sort of put it on the table and say, look, you know, we want to get your <coughs> the best informed consent we can, and so it's important to acknowledge that there are sort of potential cognitive barriers to that process. Um, so I think that's right. I mean, that can be a part of a conversation. I mean, I think, I mean, just to touch on it again, the conference that I was at about sort of science education in the public, there the discussion was all about climate change and how do we get people to understand climate change and believe it and recognize the need to act on it. But the whole time I'm sitting there listening to them talk about climate change and I'm thinking this is all like therapeutic misconception, not like this is all the same stuff. It's just in a different arena where it's about really understanding kind of what science is and what we're dealing with. I think that's what we want ideally from participants. If they have sort of, I think that some sort of understanding then you can sort of allow them to hope and be hopeful and you the investigator can hope and be hopeful. I don't think that's a problem. There's a lot of evidence that shows that people who are more optimistic or more religious with terminal disease live longer. So is it possible that their participation is actually inherently therapeutic? So, I mean, I, there there have been some studies in ALS that say that people who are in trials do better than people who are not in trials. And it's not because of their therapies or something. Just like how they conduct that trial? trial. Uh, it's oh, probably yeah. systematically <laughs> flawed and lots yes. of ways and all that. <laughs> right? But, um, and, and, you know, there, there are a thousand reasons for that that, would, that have nothing to do with whether they're hopeful. Right? You know, part of it is that. Um, assuming that, I, 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 research, understanding what research is about, a particular study, I mean, it's kind of challenging because there's a lot of science behind it and so forth, but on the other hand, among the things that people who are in a terrible situation, they have to sort of think about, read about, and learn and make a decision, uh, let's say if you use an analogy like the stock market or something, the availability of information is pretty good overall. You know, there is so that I think if you had to make this very broad, overly simplistic generalization, which is if you look at the people, if you look at clinical trials and see which ones have difficulty enrolling versus which ones, you know, have no trouble enrolling, that gives you a barometer of a lot of stuff, actually. One, if you look at, let's say, Alzheimer's disease clinical trials, I mean, they have trouble finding poor minority people entering those trials because they tend to be highly educated, wealthy people who seek out. I, would say, I wouldn't think that if you were poor with ALS living in some place, you know, remote part of Montana, they would have been calling MGH to try to get See what I'm saying? Okay. So, one of the reasons why, I mean, so when we talk about, you know, people in the trials do better, I mean, geez, you know, wealthier, healthier people, people who look like people in this room actually end up doing better in most, of, in most things in life. So, it's, it's not a surprise. So, I, I think there's a huge element to that. So I think they're all kind of, at the same time, I mean, it, it, there's one more problem in, in ALS, which is that, um, there are lots of decisions that people make about their health care along the way that really impact survival. And, and there, are, there are rational ways to make those decisions that extend survival and don't extend survival, just based on how people want to approach end of life care. And so hope is very tied to how aggressive people will be in those things. I just think, I, I don't know why they that. That's, a, that's going to be a really hard question to answer. But it certainly is, um, stands to reason that it's a nice thing to live with some hope. 
we are right at six o'clock, so I want to thank our speakers once again. For uh, please, anyone who wants to, we'll, we should have enough food for anyone who wants to come to room 447 upstairs. Uh, we can continue the conversation. Thank you.